All right. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is John Landis, and we are so happy that you're here with us this morning uh, online. Uh, again, we rather be together face to face, but uh, we're happy to be able to consider everyone's well-being during this time. If you have not heard, we're taking the two-week uh, suspension of our in-person services to meet online. So we will be back at the YMCA, God willing, on January 23rd. Uh, that'll be an exciting time to be back together. And again, I can't can't harp on this enough. I appreciate all the faith, the flexibility, and the charity, and uh, the support uh, for Lindsay and I and our leadership group as we try to make uh, the best decisions possible, uh, what we think is uh, is wise, and what we believe the Holy Spirit's communicating to us what to do for you. So I understand it's a, it's a brief inconvenience, and a lot of us, uh, including myself, are a bit over all of it. But again, we are happy to have these means uh, by which we can worship together still hear the Word of God, hear some great vulnerable and, and uh, helpful sharing as we took communion together. And I hope this time, as we hear the Word of God preached, as we continue our series in the book of Acts, uh, that it really does encourage you, give you great direction, and inspire you. And I'm really excited about the text today because we are in Acts chapter 15, as you see there on the image. Acts 15 will be uh, dealing with the text that honestly uh, doesn't normally get preached. It, uh, it gets taught a lot, but maybe not preached. But uh, I'm excited about this text because it is so influential. It really is the hinging point for the gospel of Jesus. And uh, God gives a great clout here in Acts chapter 15. And we would do well to, uh, to jump into it this morning. So again, uh, excited about the text. But uh, we are looking simply at the title, The Jerusalem Council, and all that we can learn from it uh, as we look at the gospel of grace and how we can be inspired and moved and uh, set free and un unchained uh, by the gospel of grace, which it was always meant uh, to be. So uh, anyway, we're, uh, we're excited to be together. If you wouldn't mind, uh, pray with me, and uh, then we can work our way over to chapter 15 in the book of Acts. So let's pray together. Uh, Lord in heaven, God, thank you so much for this time to be together, uh, to be able to uh, preach your word. And God, we understand and we hope to understand fuller that this text uh, all that you preserved and uh, kept together for us to be able to read uh, the ins and outs, the great intricacies of the discussion that happened in Jerusalem uh, many, many, many years ago. God, that it really was uh, an effort to keep your gospel pure, uh, to make sure that no other philosophy, uh, other worldview, uh, and especially anything that would hinder your people would ever infiltrate into the gospel. And I pray, God, that we now, as we embark on 2022, that uh, as we revel in the opportunities that a new year presents, uh, that we, as we get inspired and excited about the opportunities to be uh, new and to go forward in our goals and our hopes and our dreams, and many of us rallying to seek you more intimately, uh, to stir up our spiritual disciplines, to get after uh, following your son in a, in a great way, God, that we would allow this text and allow your gospel to hit our hearts as it's always meant to, that it really would be your gospel that infuses us and inspires us and gives us great energy moving forward. God, oh, please help us to not uh, be motivated by anything else, but help us to learn here, even as the Jerusalem Council met, uh, that we can be so inspired and so equipped uh, to be your people and to let your gospel impact us as it was always meant to. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so hopefully you can hear me okay, see me okay, and uh, we're going to get into this text. It is a, a little bit of a longer text, but we know you guys love the Bible here in the RBC, so let's uh, read along. And uh, I got a couple points, but we're going to move along, and uh, I'll try not to get too uh, nerded out by uh, some of the cool, cool factoids in here that can really help paint the picture of all that was going on here. Okay, so at this point... In Acts chapter 14, as we uh, are on the cusp of Acts, Acts chapter 15, the first missionary journey of, uh, of Paul and Barnabas has concluded. And the reason why it concludes is what they uh, go about as they return to uh, Antioch and all these different areas and what they hear about what's going on um, here in verse 1. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's read along. It says there, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised 
according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem and to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This made news, this news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So we'll stop there for now. So that's verses 1 through 4. And uh, again, what I really want to bring to bear here is that at this point in, in God's church with the apostles, uh, not just Paul and Barnabas here, but the apostles now having spread into uh, into areas like Armenia and further north into Turkey and into Alexandria, further into a- to Africa, and even uh, moving uh, eastward and southeastward into places uh, of modern-day Pakistan and northern India. The, the apostles were having this type of success as the gospel has been unleashed to the Gentile world that everyone's having the same success that Paul and, and, and Barnabas are having, that the Gentiles are, are falling over themselves in joy for the gospel that's been proclaimed to them. And it's just over, over and over and over again, these types of stories that we read in the book of Acts in, in these previous chapters, this is happening all over the world. But what we see here in a moment is that, or what we've seen already as we've read these first uh, few vo- verses, is that something so pivotal, something so important has happened that all these apostles, all these uh, disciples who who have kind of been uh, in charge or rather uh, appointed to go and preach uh, and plant these churches, they all put a full stop on this and they make their way, the long journey for many of them, the long journey back to Jerusalem. I mean, you got to think about it. Your, your ministry is having success after success and boom, we're leaving it. It's hard to leave when something's going really well, but these guys do in an instant. Why? Because the gospel has become has come under attack. The, the truth, the purity of the gospel has come under attack. And that says, okay, full stop, all stop. We're back to Jerusalem. We're going to leave the mission field and we're going to Jerusalem to talk about this. So we see here in the instance before they get to Jerusalem in verse 2, Paul and Barnabas with these people that have come to, from Judea to Antioch. And uh, these people actually were uh, Jewish Christians, meaning they were Jews first and then they converted to Christianity. So there's a, a call to kind of be a cultural Jew, submit yourself to the, Moses, the law of Moses, and then you can become a Christian. So kind of a hybrid of, uh, of, of Old Testament, New Testament, and we'll, we'll explain more of what I mean by that. But uh, Paul and Barnabas are saying, oh, oh that, those are fighting words. And a sharp debate breaks out because they're trying to infiltrate the purity of the gospel. They're trying to undermine the gospel of grace. And this is a full stop, and they all head back to Jerusalem. On their way, as it says there in verse 3, they're talking to the Gentiles. Uh, they're kind of going back through where they planted. People are fired up. They're encouraged. And then we zero in in verse 5, what happens there. <clears throat> it says, then some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Now, what that means is that these were Christians now. These were disciples of Jesus who were previously Pharisees. They were, in the, they were a part of the Pharisaic group, and that, that meant they were the top tier, the creme de la creme of, of those who were obedient to the law of Moses. That in their mind and in their approach, to their relationship with God, it was all about obedience leading to righteousness. So these men, and we'll, we'll throw in the women here too, these men and women who kind of came from this, uh, this position, these are their strengths, and they're bringing that into the, the kingdom. They're bringing that into the, the church of Christ uh, that, you know what? It's hard for us to say goodbye to these, these disciplines equal righteousness. So those are the folks that are coming here it's not just a, a, the Pharisaic group over there that still hasn't been converted. This, these are your brothers and sisters who are very, very spiritually disciplined, and they're bringing that in uh, as, a, as a requirement to be, to be saved. Specifically circumcised, but that encapsulates uh, really the message of 
submitting yourself to the Mosaic law uh, in its entirety. So there in verse 6, hopefully you're following along. Uh, say something in the chat to encourage me that you're following along with all this because it is a bit teachy in the beginning. So appreciate you. Uh, verse 6, it says, The apostles and elders met to consider the question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. We did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, that's what it says there in the text. No, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So now here, who's Peter, uh, which along with Jesus' brother James, uh, of kind of taking the mantle of the leadership of Jerusalem. But Peter, who, who shows up here, and again, I think it's significant that it's Peter because Peter, uh, and uh, eventually James will speak up. These two guys uh, are, are kind of known, uh, a lot of street cred, obviously, in the early church, but specifically uh, Peter and James, when they speak to the Gentiles and bringing them in, the, the, the inclusivity of having the Gentiles, that the Pharisees are going to believe this a bit more than if Paul, uh, even though he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, that even if Paul or Barnabas were the ones speaking here, though I'm out on the mission field, Peter and James still in Jerusalem holding it down, they're listening and will be more persuaded by these two apostles speaking to what God has done than perhaps Paul and Barnabas. But what G Peter says here is so important to us. It's so important uh, for us, not just na then, but here and now for us. But I do want you to understand that this is a potential tipping point for the church uh, to somehow uh, to taint the, the purity of the gospel of grace. And, and, and this for us is so important for our hearts, not just because it's the new year, but as we move forward, that the gospel of grace is not tainted by any type of legalism or, honestly, performance-driven uh, grace, performance-driven acceptance, performance-driven relationship with God, that it's all about grace being the motivator for our lives, for why we would want to love, why we would want to obey, why we would want uh, to do what's right, why we would want to flee from sin and repent and change. Why, why, why? The why is so important always, but here we see it in the text, and we got to bring it to the here and now too for you and I. But I do want you to understand that here in verse 10, Peter is saying, why are you trying to test God? By putting on the neck of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. You know, we're, we're in the suburb, suburbs, you know, the city. Uh, we're not out in the field. You guys know what a yoke is. It's, it, it's, to, it's, to, it's to really hem in beasts of burden, an oxen or a donkey or a horse or whatever it might be, to restrict them, to keep them in line in a way that just shackles them down rather than being free uh, to use their strength and gifts to work and to do life. So Peter uses that illustration saying that it, it's this sense of bringing in this, not just the Mosaic law, but bringing in these expectations, expectations that you can do this to achieve righteousness is a burden they couldn't do. And of course, the Gentiles wouldn't be able to do. And of course, if you've been around for longer than a day, you know you can't do and I can't do. You know, what's the purpose of the Mosaic law then? What was the intent of, of all that God put together in the Leviticus law? You can look back uh, in chapters uh, Leviticus, uh, particularly Leviticus 17, to see all of these type of Levitical laws. You can go through that in regards to the blood and not eating of strangled animals, and we'll get to that section here in a, in a, in a bit. But kind of all these restrictions, what was the purpose of the Mosaic law? Well, if you don't know, let me tell you, the purpose of the Mosaic law was to, was to hem in the Jews, to hem in the, the, the law, to purify it, to make sure it's not tainted, 
that to not go off intermarrying with different uh, different people people groups, so that the Jews who have been entrusted with the truth, so that truth would be preserved perfectly, so that when God, in His foreknowledge, releases the Messiah into the world, we have this truth that has been protected, that has been carried along by the Jews. It was never meant to be just them. They were never meant to be a superior race, a chosen people in the sense that they're better than anyone else, but they were chosen to kind of be the first wave and to protect it. And then the Messiah would come and unleash it, unleash that protected gospel into the world. So that was the intent. But the intent of all these specific laws was to keep the people pure, was to keep them holy and set apart so that they would not have this tainted religion, this tainted truth to be able to spread to the whole world. So even in the specifics, which we'll get into of uh, kosher laws and what to eat and what not to eat and all those kind of things, was to really make it almost extremely difficult to eat with a Jew that you wouldn't even want to. They're so different. They're so, they're so set apart that it would be difficult to even mix it up with them. And again, it wasn't a superiority. It was to preserve truth so that it could be unleashed to us. Hopefully that makes sense. But it also, in that, we know that the Mosaic Law could not be fulfilled. We saw our sin in the Mosaic Law. We saw that we could not attain righteousness, holiness, rightness with God, justification on our own. We couldn't do it. There's no way that we could do it. So it's meant to show our sinful, utter dependence upon God saving us rather than us feeling like we can get it going on to save ourselves or to put us in a position where God now should save us. So it's meant to show us our need. It's meant to show that we're broken and we need to be healed. It's meant to show the world as broken and needing to be redeemed. And the Mosaic Law is meant to set us up for God's grand reversal to heal all that is broken, to justify all that is condemned, and to restore all that's broken. And that's our hearts, and that's our communities, and that's our church, and that's our world. That's the point of the Mosaic Law. But there's some people in the Jew, in the Jewish group, in the Jewish culture, and throughout the Gospels, the Pharisees, that thought, you know what? We can do this. We can do it. We can do it enough. We can do it well enough to be considered righteous. And if everybody else would just get on the horse and do it too, then you can be righteous as well. As well, Just get on with it. Get Come on. Quit doing that. Start doing this. You can do it. No, they couldn't. And no, you can't. You can't perform. You can't produce. You can't do. You can't not do enough to get God to love you, to get God to save you. And Peter is doubling down on that again. And he's showing here in verse, uh, verse 12 now, as we hear uh, another chief speaker in, in James, verse 12, it says, The whole assembly became silent, I bet, as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. So again, story time, just beautiful one thing after another about what God has done. When they finished, James spoke up. Ooh, ooh, okay. What's James got to say? James is is a, a kind of an elite bro in my eyes. Like, whoa, James, he's he's the man. He's the brother of Jesus. And he's also going to get the street cred that the Pharisees and those who have come from that Pharisaical sect are going to be like, all right, let's see what James has to say. You with me? So he says, brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles, the words of the prophet are in agreement with this as it is written. And he goes on to quote Amos chapter 9. And verse, verse 19, it says, It is my judgment, still James, therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city, from the earliest times, and is read in the synagogues of every Sabbath. Interesting list there. And uh, we're not going to get into it today. We don't have the time. But again, check out Leviticus 17. And I want you to look at this list. I need to say this. 
is that this was not a list issued by the apostles or James or the early church that you got to do these things to be saved. It's not, it's not back to what the Pharisees said. Hey, you need to, you need to be circumcised to be saved. Okay, you got to not do this, not do this, not do this, and then you're saved. These aren't do this to be saved. This is do this to be in fellowship, to actually connect, to, to help us and you to be unified. These are, uh, these are kind of be set apart this, to, to kind of have the commonalities of fellowship, to not step on our sensitive toes, to not kind of be in, in clash with one another. This is, a, this is a welcome to, hey, this would really help us, not this will help you to be saved. Does that make sense? Again, don't have the time to discuss it. Uh, we will maybe more so in a Wednesday night uh, to teach on that. Um, and yeah, w- that would be great for, for sure. So I just want to make it really clear. They didn't have to do those things to be saved. Now you're like, whoa, sexual morality. What are you talking about? They could just kind of go willy nilly uh, if it wasn't for this kind of list. Well, what we're talking about here is this culture of sexual morality, the worship of gods and Aphrodite and the Greek cultures and Romans and all that kind of stuff that they would be very much uh, a part of. They were a part of. And they would even just kind of rub shoulders with it, not necessarily jumping right into it. But as you'll see, is a lot of the letters in the New Testament. There's a lot of that preached. Uh, First Corinthians, sexual morality, a lot of the Gentile letters. That's a huge one. And I would argue it's a big one still today, uh, 2,000 plus years later. So again, this set apartness. Uh, but even that motivation will come from, from grace. So again, this is what they, they write. And in verse 22, it says, uh, the whole, uh, Then the apostles... And elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. All right, so we're not just sending Paul and Barnabas back uh, and them just kind of keep saying what they're going to say, like, oh, well, who are you? But they choose some of their own men. I think twofold one, to go witness what God has done to the Gentiles firsthand, but then also to, to be a, a, a group of witnesses to share what had been discussed in Jerusalem. So they did. So they choose Judas, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. All right. So uh, they write this letter and it says there in verse 24, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. I'm going to stop there for dramatic effect because these Gentiles who have been waiting to find out what has been discussed in the Jerusalem Council, what are they going to come back with? You know, these men and women are... are are wondering what kind of Mosaic law will they have to fulfill? Will there be uh, a circumcision that's going to require, be required? Like, will the men have to line up here after this, this letter to be circumcised? Like, oh my goodness, could you imagine? So with the following requirements, it's like, you know, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? Oh, you know, no, 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 no. And then it says you are to abstain from food, sacrifice to idols. Okay, I knew that from blood. I like my steak rare, but all right. From the meat of strangled animals. Oh, it's so easier just to wring a chicken's neck rather than, you know, drain the blood. But okay. And from sexual immorality. Okay, that's everywhere around me. That's my entire culture. But yes, we'll do that. You will do well to avoid these things. Period. No circumcision. Yeah, for sure. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Enoch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. Everyone's on edge. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. I bet. Okay, so there we go. That's that's the text for today. That's a lot. We're 20 minutes in, maybe even a little bit more. And uh, I mentioned how important this was for the early church, that uh, there's a a potential tipping point for the kind of Phariseeism or... Uh, kind of a metric-based approach to God to be continued with the gospel. That to somehow kind of smash in a culture and the gospel to create a new gospel altogether. And God, in his foreknowledge, did did everything he could to keep the Jews, to keep the gospel pure. 
And then now with the gospel being proclaimed everywhere, this gospel of beautiful, beautiful grace, here we have an instance where the gospel, gospel could be tainted. And it's interesting. I want you to understand how important this is because, you know, Satan doesn't decide to, all right, let's, uh, let's try to get this church off track here uh, by kind of mixing it up with some sexual temptation. Uh, or let's try to mix it up with, uh, you know, more, more persecution. Yeah, I tried that. Uh, but what he does do is let's see if I can get them to somehow cultivate their culture, their understanding, their own wisdom, their, their performance into this. And I believe if I can get them to, perf- to be focused on performance, on meritocracy, on how well am I doing something, that, that will, that'll throw a wrench, that'll be a stick in the bike, in the spokes of your wheel to not only slow them down, but just make their relationship with God, their Christianity, just grind to a halt, to limit its impact, to slow it down, to let it be just grind, clinching teeth, uh, burdensome. That's what I'm going to try to do. You think, oh my goodness, this is Satan's attempt to grind down the gospel into something it's never meant to be, to make our Christianity just kind of trudging along, pushing through, knocking down wall after wall, insecurity after insecurity, feeling good, then feeling not so good, feeling like the gospel's unchained, feeling like it is chained, back and forth, back and forth, I'm good, I'm not, I stink, I'm good, all that, have you ever felt that way? I know I have, I know that honestly, in my heart of hearts, I realized and realize oftentimes I think you can relate as we bring it to there and then to the here and now that I myself can be a disciple of discipleship, not of Jesus, but a disciple of discipleship, a disciple of the things that disciples do, that, that my, ex, my excitement for spiritual disciplines, my excitement to do disciply things, to, to be active in bringing the gospel, to do things that That can be my gospel rather than just letting grace and who Jesus is and what he's done and what event happened, his death, burial, and resurrection and his resurrection to be all that I trust in. Instead of that, it's how well have I done lately? How many pages did I flip in my Bible today? How long did I stay on my knees in prayer? How many people did I share my faith with? How's the attitude of the church? Is the church growing? Is this happening? Are people pleased with me? Was that sermon good? Did that sermon bomb? Was that a stinky one? Was that a good one? Was that a mediocre one? And that kind of being uh, what I get, my, uh, my, my belief that God is with me or loves me. Anybody else out there? And your metrics may be different, but nonetheless, it's still based on what you do and how well you do it or how poorly you've been doing it. And I think we've got to be careful to see that Um, that type of thinking, that type of worldview, that type of quote unquote gospel would cause Paul and Barnabas to leave everything they were doing and come have a conversation with us that they would leave, you know, full stop and get in and have a conversation with the RVC. What are you talking about? What are you doing? Really? That's your thought? No, 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 no. And recapture the purity of the beautiful gospel of grace. I think it's so important as we as we move ahead in 2022, that we do that this morning and help each other to do that in the here and now. Again, it's good for us to think about that we have a tendency because in our culture, nothing operates like the gospel of grace. You don't study for your test, you're going to fail. You don't show up to work, your boss isn't going to come to you and say, hey, you know, how can I motivate you to come to work? Do you want me to give you a raise in hopes to kind of spark the industrialism of your mind and your soul to to help you to show up? You know, your teacher doesn't come in the first day of the semester upcoming here next couple weeks. Hey, guys, everyone's going to get an A. And I hope that that motivates you to love this information, to, to search it out, to dig into it, to read this textbook, to really go after it with all that you got. I really hope that my favor for you would motivate you all the more 
to walk with me in all this, this semester. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at all. So because our culture rails against that, or excuse me, our culture pushes that, shoves that way down into the downtowns of our hearts, we have a hard time accepting this gospel that God loves us, that God has given us acceptance, that God affirms us, that we are in his presence, that we actually belong because of him. He loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. And therefore, my response is, of course, I want to follow you. Of course, I want to trust you with everything I've got. And of course, I want others to know this as well. So we've got to recognize that and you've got to recognize that if we understand the gospel of grace, one thing is going to disappear. One thing is going to disappear and it's the bonds of performance-driven ministry or the bonds, the shackles of performance-driven discipleship, performance-driven grace. Those bonds, those shackles, that hindrance is meant to be busted out because of the gospel of grace. And I know me for sure. You guys have all heard of sleep number beds. You know, it's like the perfect number for you to just kind of get into homeostasis, to kind of comfort, to feel like, ah, I, I'm, I'm just right. Kind of like a Goldilocks principle. And I know for my sleep number, uh, what I mean by that is kind of thinking of some of the uh, things that I do in discipleship and I remember from a very early on time in, in the campus ministry where we would have a Bible discussion. I, I, I helped shepherd a Bible discussion on Tuesdays uh, at, at Old Dominion University in the student center called the Web Center. And uh, I remember, you know, getting out of class around uh, 1145 and then uh, Bible discussion would be at 1230. And I remember this kind of like, all right, cool. I, I want to see people come and, and get to it. And I'd have a sleep number of like, OK, well, I'm leading the Bible talk. so. I should invite a number of people. And I remember many a times where I'd go and I'd invite people to the corner of the web where we'd be meeting and they'd say, sure, I'd be coming. I'll, I'll come for sure. And I know what that did to my heart. As soon as I had a guest, I was like, all right, cool. I'm, I'm done. I'm good. I got a visitor. And my heart would kind of be like, all right, I don't feel the need to invite or share anymore. And there are other times where I'd, I'd share with, uh, with three four people, and no one was coming. And I'd say, well, I'm leading the Bible talk. Uh, I need to share more. I need to maybe have four or five so that I can kind of, if nobody has a, a guest, I can kind of know like, you know what? I share with four or five. And if anyone asks me, I can share that. And I, I feel, feel good about that. And then there'd be other times where uh, as I got older and went into the full-time ministry, I'm down at Virginia Tech and in, in, uh, in, in, in their student center, I'm thinking, well, I'm a, I'm a minister. I'm a campus minister. I've got I've to share with more. So what would kind of be a, a good number uh, to kind of help people think like, all right, yeah, man, you're, you're really doing your job. And that was kind of it. And uh, we're, okay, eight, you know, seven's a perfect number. How about that? Maybe 10. And that would kind of be this, this mark where like, all right, all right, sounds good. I'm good. And that would kind of be this performance. And it wasn't just sharing your faith, but what about you and uh, some of our, our spiritual disciplines or our goals? You know, we, we think, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my Bible uh, more than ever before this year. That's my spiritual goal. Let's say you, uh, you really went after it and you read more and you turned more pages in your Bible this year. And you're thinking, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. That, that, that's enough. And then there's other times where maybe your prayer life isn't so good. Uh, You've gotten caught up in reading the, you know, ESPN articles and not taking out, carving out time with your relationship with God or say you haven't shared your faith uh, in a long time. Or, you know what, you haven't uh, been a good shepherd and, you know, picking up the phone or calling people to check up on them. And rather you're just watching Hulu or looking at social media instead. Or uh, maybe you've struggled with your purity already this year or last year. And you're like, man, uh, gosh, so we can kind of be in one of two places. You know, when things are not going well. Uh, with this type of performance-based grace, you know, we can feel like, you know what? We're in the doghouse. We're in the doghouse spiritually. Like, man, I stink. I'm the worst. And, you know, we, we view God as, you know what? I, I, I love you, but I don't like you right now. And, you know, when are you going to get it together and change and repent? And when are you going to come see me in your prayer life and reading your Bible? And when are you going to make the adjustments? 
when are you going to change? Hurry up. And then I'll really not, not just love you because I'm God, but I'll really enjoy you and I'll like you. And we have that. And I know some of us wrestle with that. This performance-based grace. And the gospel of grace has no place for that. And uh, we'll talk more about that. But let's say the reverse is true, that uh, you're really killing it. You're really going for it. You, you comparatively feel like, oh my gosh, man, I've increased by 5% in my spiritual disciplines. You know, whatever. Wow, look at me. I'm really doing it. You know, I've, I've been pure for this amount of time. I've, I've gone after this for this much time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you kind of feel like, all right, I've got it going on. I'm doing it. 5% increase of my spirituality. I'll take that. And if it compounds every year, let's go. And we can go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in our understanding of who we are uh, before God. So you're in the doghouse this morning or you're on, you're on top of the world. You're in the doghouse or you're on top of the world. You know, again, we, we get in both of those spots all the time. But the truth is, you know what? That type of thinking will cause you and me to go from this unhindered running race for Jesus to a crawl from a, from a, a, a liberated, excited, grace bound excitement to, you know what, maybe I grow a little bit and all right, is that it? And maybe we kind of look around and we see a number of people become Christians, but we don't see this, this impact that we see in the new Testament. We're like, Oh, okay. Uh, and the truth is guys, Jesus didn't come. That's what Peter and James and Paul and Barnabas, Jesus didn't come to the world and die for us so that we could be more disciplined. Jesus didn't come and get stripped and lashed and, sh and strewn about so that you and I could feel like, all right, let me just kick it up a notch and kind of find my sleep number as to when I can feel good about my performance in Christ. That's not what he came for. He didn't come for that. He didn't come. And you'll never know life to the full if that's how you live. You'll never know the freedom of being wrapped up in grace to go after it in a tremendous way. You'll never know. We are called to trust a very specific event. To trust that Jesus came and died for our sins. Came and was killed for us so that we could be made righteous. And to trust that event that because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you and I may live a new life if we trust it and pour our hearts into it. You know, I'm going to read this as we wrap up here and think about some practicals as to what might be produced in you as we sink our teeth into this real gospel of grace. You know, a, a reading here to kind of encapsulate this gospel is you are more wrath-bound, weak, repulsive, maggot swarm of decomposing defilement, so polluted by sin and shame that nothing holy or divine can even look at you, much less embrace you. And yet, at the same time, you are actually more honored and dignified, more lovely, loved, embraced in value, more respected, more potent, more pleasing and pure, more admired and desired, and more significant and pivotal to all creation, and more delightful to the Creator than you ever dared hope. That's the gospel. That's the gospel, and it's meant to unshackle us of the pressure of performance, to run the race that Paul ran with God's speed and with God delight. That's what we're meant to have, to rejoice in Jesus, to not play, to play not to lose, but to play to win. To run in faith and trust that Jesus' obedience saves me rather than my own. And when that breaks through, when that gets into the downtown of our hearts, my heart will no longer prefer the construct of control that performance brings. The sense that I can measure my own, my own righteousness by what I do and don't do. But I'll be able to accept and embrace and love and be fueled by the surrender the out-of-control stance of the surrender to the gospel of grace. You know, it's that grace, Titus 2, verse 11, says that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. 
That's what's meant to motivate us and teach us. So as we jump into 2022, as we launch into the rest of the book of Acts, as we go after being disciples of Jesus, and we can look back on our year and look back even as our church and kind of say, well, we got to get it together. We got to be more like Jesus. So we got to speak the truth to each other. We've got to get after sharing our faith again, or we've got to be more hospitable, or we got to love people more deeply, or we need to share our faith relentlessly, or I need to get my Bible study back up to top notch. I need to grow 1% every day in my spiritual disciplines. I got to do Bible in a year. I got to do this whole stuff. And it doesn't mean don't do those things, but it, it, it reshifts your motivation to, oh my goodness, Jesus didn't die so that my response would be that. Now I can be free. I can be free from cultural expectations. I can be free that I got to come become like this in order to, to be right with God. I get to follow Jesus, look at him, run the race unhindered. And then, and I believe only then, will we see more and more of what we see in the New Testament right here in Roanoke. Like, oh my goodness, the, the, the caps busted off because the church is living fueled by grace. Not by performance, not by the pendulum swing of doghouse to the man on campus. From the man on campus to the doghouse. To best in show to the worst in show and left for dead. That's not who God wants us to be. And the gospel's not meant to be that way. It was protected from the beginning so that it could be unleashed when the Messiah showed up in God's foreknowledge. And that is Jesus. And as we fix our eyes on him, as we relish in the gospel of grace... And as we understand that that gospel is not meant to put a yoke, a burden of self-performance on, but rather to lift that meritocracy and to have us trust in his obedience, his performance, his love. Oh my goodness, what could happen? So consider where your, where your yokes are. Consider the patterns of your ways. Consider a gospel that may not be the gospel at all. Think about where that creeps in and take that cap, capture those thoughts this week. And when they come up, when Satan tries to get in there, both uh, macro and micro in your heart, put a full stop and have a sharp debate with him, with the truth of the gospel as to what Jesus did, what he did on the cross and what he does for us every day as he sanctifies us more and more. Let's be that way for each other. Let's be that way as we move forward for our community. And let's just watch God work as the disciples here in the RVC are unshackled from a gospel that's no gospel at all, and now equipped with grace, equipped with that event that we trust in, and maybe we can glory in God's work in Roanoke and Roanoke County and beyond.